doing something over you know, Google Hangout. Well, the simple fact is, is that, that Kent does his job over Google Hangout. He doesn't travel. He's had enough of that. Um, he prefers like being happily married than living some bullshit life where you spend all of your time in the plane and that may come under threat. So he lives out in the boonies and does things by Hangout, um, which I just think is interesting. So uh, has recently been working with Facebook. He mentors a lot of their younger engineers. He shares his craft and helps them understand how to become more effective as developers. Um, and he, I don't think, can hear any of this. So, so he has no idea what is going on. He's looking a little bit pissed off. Um, he didn't wear a tie-dye t-shirt today. So I'm basically going to ask him to tell us about how you share craft kind of and, and, and train and, 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 and uh, sort of foster skills in developers over distance. How do you do that? And, um, and uh, I'm going to ask him to start talking and we'll see what happens. Because uh, it also, you know, because carbon. Hello, I'm uh, Kent Beck, and I'm a programmer at Facebook. Um, I realize that uh, I'm all that stands between you all and beer, uh, so I will be brief in my remarks, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to talk to you today. Uh, thank you, James, for setting all of this up uh, so carefully beforehand. I really appreciate that. Um, it takes a lot of the stress out of a situation like this. So... Um, uh, what I do at Facebook is a, a combination of things. Uh, uh, one part of my job is uh, studying, empirically studying software design and software process. Uh, so the, there's a lot of that going on at Facebook, and I have access to all of the, the Git repos and to the project management uh, data, so I can look for patterns in how people develop software. And, um, Second uh, leg of what I do is I'm a programmer and I love programming. Um, so I spent a fair amount of my time working on speculative projects. Uh, some are in product uh, kind of projects, some are in infrastructure, some are in uh, uh, developer tools. And that's uh, my most recent project has been uh, a code editor that's not a text editor. And if you're more interested in that, uh, I can talk to you more about that later. But the, uh, what I'd like to talk to you uh, about today is a coaching program that I run. Um, about 18 months ago, I was looking around for something, uh, something to do that was, uh, that was uh, unique, something that I could do that not a lot of other people at Facebook could do. And in talking to uh, young engineers, I noticed that there was a, a common pattern. Some engineers, every engineer who comes to Facebook is overwhelmed. It's just this fire hose of crazy amounts of attention and data and pressure and new technology and scale you've never thought of before. And it's just overwhelming. Pretty much everybody learns to swim in that. The first six months, you're learning so fast. Stuff's coming at you. You've just you've never done data extraction at that scale before, and you've never done data extraction before. Period. And you have a task, and that's what you have to do. So you figure it out and you do it. Um, uh, there aren't lots of specialists at Facebook, so you're learning really rapidly for about six months. Then what I noticed is there's a small group of people who continue learning at that same pace. So comes out of school, learn, 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 and then just keeps going. And those people at Facebook can rise very quickly and have a lot of responsibility in a short period of time if they keep on the same pace. But most engineers taper off. After about six months, most engineers kind of hit a plateau. They've learned to do their job. They're doing their job. They're getting tasks done. They're, they're discharging their responsibilities. But they're doing the same kinds of things over and over again. And I think this is just kind of a, uh, you know, there's only so much um, that, uh, so much stress 
that, that to people can handle, and most people's appetite for that kind of tops out. So you've got uh, this large group of very talented programmers who have learned very quickly and then kind of plateaued. Now, it's not that they're not having new experiences. They're still having new experiences, but they're not doing a brand new thing every day. And after about a year of that, uh, what my belief was that there would be a large number of these people in kind of in the people in this in this group who would be ready for another boost. They collected a bunch of experiences, hadn't really digested them yet, and a little bit of a shake would uh, would get them going. And um, so I started a coaching program. Uh, at first, it was just me. Uh, now there's a half dozen coaches, um, and uh, the the coaching sessions have a, a limited duration. Uh, typically, for my sessions, because I'm remote, it's one month of uh, daily pair programming sessions, um, and uh, with some of the other coaches, like if they're uh, co-located, they might meet twice a week, for example, for six weeks or eight weeks or something like that. The format of the sessions is, it from the outside, it just looks like pair programming. Typically, you pick a project that's kind of on the periphery of what the programmer would normally be working on. Because if it's the task they have to get done that day, there's a lot of stress associated with it. And if you tell them, oh, that was good, let's uh, wipe that, you know, get reset, let's uh, start over on this, they tend to freak out. So it's good if it's something that's that's related to what they're doing, so they have motivation, but is not on their critical path. And then you work on it every day, and as you work, you have conversations, as you do in pair programming. Now, when I started this, I expected that the conversations would be very technical things. The the, the takeaways for people would be pair pro, it would be test-driven development, design for testability, coupling and cohesion refactoring, you know, big changes in small, safe steps, all of all that kind of stuff. And um, I've coached probably 30 engineers at this point. And for very few of them have those kind of, of uh, conversations been uh, the, the main thing that they take away. Um, there, I certainly have a range of responses to coaching. So probably 20% of the people have no visible changes after coaching. Like you just program for a while and then they go and they're doing whatever they were doing. Um, probably 20% of the people that I coach really go up like a rocket. And uh, I can't really predict that or see patterns in it. It's just it was the right intervention at the right time and they, they really learn quickly. But the people in the middle, I, I found, were, were quite interesting. After the coaching session's over, they, they have obviously learned a lot. They report back, and their managers report back, wow, you know, the, after the, the coaching session, their, their work really was transformed. But what they seem to learn in those sessions is again not not technical stuff at all it's much the the best summary i can provide for it is they learn to waste less time so in every engineer's workflow there's a bunch of wasted time um you know and it can be a, a variety of things but n none of us are are absolutely blazing all of the time uh, as we're engineering, we're, we're not making the best priority decisions, um, time management, and so on. The thing about being an older programmer, which despite my looks, I am, uh, is that I've made all of the mistakes that I see my students making. And I've had to deal with all the issues that, that, they're, that they're dealing with. And I find uh, it, it's it's challenging sometimes to see it, to be patient, to, to kind of let the relationship develop. But uh, I see people, and it's it's often a misplaced focus on efficiency 
that trips up young engineers. So uh, a young engineer will do one thing and then think, well, if I pause for feedback now, that will take time. So I'm going to do another thing and another thing and another thing. And, oh, I better make sure this still runs. And then they discover it doesn't run. Well, is it the first change, the second change, the third change, the fourth change, or the first and the third, or the, uh, you got a big debugging problem. Now, this is a, 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 a difficult to learn as an engineer because it's a short-term, long-term trade-off. Yeah, let me pay a little bit now to get the feedback so that every once in a while I don't have to spend two weeks debugging. It's probably it's almost certainly a good economic trade-off, but that's a hard thing to learn, especially when you're in the moment and you think I gotta go faster, I gotta go faster, I gotta go faster. Um, uh, another set of uh, time wasters is uh, 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 half-done work. So uh, the first one was doing two things. The second one is doing half a thing and then switching to something else. Now, some of the people I work with are, are genuinely ADD, um, and I, I certainly learn lean that way. So uh, I, can, I can spot it when it happens. Hey, we were getting this test case to run, and now we're in this completely different file refactoring. I, I, did we talk about this? Oh, no, we didn't. Okay, so how about if we go back and finish the first thing and then do the second thing? And we'll just write this down on a piece of paper so we don't forget it. Oh, okay. And, uh, and for a, I was going to say problem like that, it's a problem. It's, it's less than you could be. For a problem like that, just simple tricks like having a piece of paper. You know, I just always have a piece of paper beside me and a thought comes to me, I write it down and get back to work. But somebody who hasn't seen that trick will just switch and then switch to the next thing and switch to the next thing and never get any single thing done. Um, uh, another set of time wasters is uh, making things really nice before you know whether they'll work at all. So this was my dad taught me the first day I started programming, make it run, make it right, make it fast. And uh, engineers, especially when they've really started learning, like at first you don't know good from bad. Then you know good from bad, but you don't know when good from bad. So they try and make everything good, except oftentimes it's not worth it. So if you can run a, a cheap little experiment to see oh, is this function even being called? You know, I think if I have a function like this here, then then things will be right. But is this even being called? Well, let me just check that before I go on to the next thing. It's a little ugly, you know, console logs or beeping or whatever, but you have some feedback. Okay, I know this works. Now it's definitely worth making it uh, nice and tidy. But separating those two things is a, is a kind uh, not separating those two things, lumping them together, trying to do a really good job of a problem. Uh, solving a problem that may not need to be solved is is wasteful. So we sit down together. I, I work remotely, so I I live on a, a farm in southern Oregon, and uh, I'm not moving to the Silicon Valley or any place else for that matter. So I end up working remotely. Um, I use, uh, uh, we use uh, either Skype or uh, Cisco video equipment to connect um, via video. Most people like that. Some people like audio only, um, but most people we have video. And then I use a screen sharing program called Screen Hero. Um, I'll uh, put that in, which is a fairly recent the screen sharing program that has the best um, latency of any of the screen sharing programs that I've tried and the easiest setup. The, the killer with remotely teaching is, uh, is all the technical glitches. So I'd rather have worse tools that are rock solid reliable, even though the quality might not be as good, than have something that could be blazingly fast or could not work at all. Because it's just so frustrating to sit down and say, okay, 
you know, yesterday we did X, today we get to do Y. Oh, you know, crap, the, the, the video is not coming through. So uh, I would like to avoid that at all costs and keep the momentum of, of the, um, uh, the conversation going. So besides this kind of uh, wasting less time, uh, that's one set of things that, that's come away from, from the experience I've, I've had doing this. Uh, the other big lesson for me is this is not technical. This is about building personal relationships. And, you know, I got into computing so I wouldn't have to have personal relationships. I find it uh, ironic and a little bit evil that my effectiveness on the job really depends on how well I can connect with other people. But it's absolutely true. Every student that, that, that learns, that comes out of coaching changed, every single one, the third week is critical. The first two weeks, you're just doing some technical stuff, you know, writing this test, you're doing this refactoring or whatever. The third week is when real, deep, personal conversations happen. I had one uh, yesterday. It's the middle of the third week of a session with a student, and we talked about managing anxiety as as programmers. Turns out we're both anxious at times, uh, bad enough that it needs management. And so, what do you do about that? Well, that's not a conversation that you can have with somebody that you don't trust. So. The, the first two weeks is, is really just kind of getting to know each other. And the third week and the fourth week, you can have these real conversations about the real issues about being a programmer, which has nothing to do with coupling and cohesion, much as I wish it did. But that's really what coaching comes down to. Can you be trustworthy? Can you offer that trustworthiness to your student? And if you can, then you can have real conversations that make a real difference uh, for their lives. And it's not a natural skill for me. It's something I'm working on. But as more experienced programmers, I think we have both an opportunity and an obligation to pass on what we've learned. The, the opportunity is it's incredibly enriching for me to be a coach, that's the, the, the deep, dark secret that um, uh, I get more out of it than they do, and I get to do it with more people, so I'm getting far more out of coaching than they are. Um, but it, it's also an opportunity because the next generation of people are going to be coding my pacemaker, and uh, I'd sure like it if they could do a better job rather than a worse job. So, James, thank you so much for the invitation to talk. Um, I, I wish I was there. Uh, the, uh, the, the cheeses sound lovely. I have goats. I make cheese. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe sometime in the future I'll, I'll be able to actually visit the, uh, the real event. But in the meantime, uh, all the best to you all, and I hope you enjoy the evening's festivities. Thanks. Bye-bye. We don't really have a lot of time for Q&A. With, with talent that awesome, you can still do awesome uh, even when you fuck up. So that, I fucked up and he was awesome. Um.